So what is this? What are we going to do for that? All right. We're going to talk about leadership from a certain perspective. We're going to talk about it in terms of teams, in terms of projects, in terms of innovation. I know Marianne talked a lot about innovation. Um, in terms of solutions. Um, at IMD in Switzerland where I was, and this is kind of the genesis of this research and the topic for today, a lot of executives from all over the world, including some of your firms, would come there and they would want to be educated in leadership or change or strategy, and those are all the things I teach. And then they would also bring their issues to IMD, so we would get into their issues, their change initiatives, their their projects and so forth, and I'm a firm believer that so much happens in terms of teams and projects and organizations. I mean, I almost think it's getting to a point where if things aren't in projects and teams, they're going to be automated on computer systems, right? I mean, so it's either teams working to get things done or stuff is going to be automated, supply chain, whatever, all that, and there's not going to be a lot in between. And it's teams of knowledge professionals and so forth from different disciplines that have to accomplish change and, and make things happen. So that's kind of the perspective um, that we're going to have of leadership. It's not leadership of the firm. It's not strategy. It's really how do you make teams and how do you have teams do great things. Fair enough? Um, and at IMD, what we witnessed, and maybe what you see is, and I did all this before I got in here today, because I always, every, I, I start this, I say, okay, what do I want to do? How do I want to position this? Um, what we witnessed in my experience were a lot of these teams start with hopes, dreams, aspirations. Like we want to get something done. We want to start a, a new initiative, a new, a new initiative. We want to change something. We have a new project or program. We have new products and services. All of these represent innovations and in that they represent, um, represent change and new ideas. But all teams would come to IMD with hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Or we'd go to these firms all over the world, right? And a lot of times it would be we're going to change the company, we're going to change the division, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And they bring people together, and what happened was, thought, more often than not, the colleague, my colleague Bill Fisher and I, we work with these firms, and at best it would be a modest success or a failure, or it would be okay. But what we witnessed, what we didn't see time and time again, was great. You know, where's great? Where were great results? Things that really made a difference, that really stuck. In Mary Ann's terms, she talked about the diffusion of innovations, right? I mean. Where, where were ideas that really moved throughout the organization that were adopted and diffused and used everywhere? A lot of times we just didn't see it. Now, I know you've all had great successes. We've had a few. But more often than not, this is what we saw. So there's a disconnect. Great hopes, great dreams, great aspirations. Teams put together projects, leaders. Kind of just nothing. Not much happens. Right. So why is that the situation? You know, is it leadership? Is it something? What's going on? And we basically came to some conclusions. And the conclusions, number one, is that there's an energy crisis out there. And it's an energy crisis not in fossil fuel, right? But it's an energy crisis in terms of tapping into the talent that's available. I mean, I am a firm believer that organizations, big bureaucracies, sap the energy out of people. I mean, and and, and it's, it's interesting, you work with these firms, and I know the kind of students that graduated from BC, that graduate from BC, whether it's graduate students, MBAs, or undergrads, and you know the kind of people you are and the kind of people you hire. They're, they're ambitious, they, they want to get things done, they have great experiences, they have passion, they get into organizations, and all of a sudden the energy is just sucked right out of them, right? Yes. And there's something about, organ and not only the energy, worse than that, their ideas. Everybody sits around and agrees with each other. It's like, oh my, it, what happens? I'm not sure what happens, but I think organizations dumb things down. So there's this energy crisis. And if you're going to have dreams, and you're going to have hopes and dreams and aspirations, and you're going to want to make a difference with your initiatives and community involvement, you don't want to end up here. You want to end up with great outcomes. And so how do you get around that energy crisis? And I just think it's real. Um, and it, underscoring that is just talent is underutilized. We go to great lengths to hire this great talent. They, they, great grades, you know, great achievements, and then they bring them in, and it's like, what happens? Everything kind of gets, turns to average, and you wonder something in between. And one way to think about it, and we're going to get into this today, is also how much percent of brain power is wasted or really tapped into, which you'll see why I think that's real important, because we hire people not for the strength of their backs, but for what's in their heads. 
right? We want their best ideas, their best insights, their experiences. Well, how do we get at that? And so much of brain power is wasted. Um, I once did a, a program with a firm, Norwegians, and it was Norsk Hydro, a big Nor Norwegian kind of a mineral oil, oil firm. And we were talking about finance and returns, and return on capital and all that stuff. And there was an engineer in the room and said, you know, no one ever measures how much of the brain how much of my brain power, what percentage of my brain power is being tapped into every week. You know, we don't think about that. We have all sorts of financial measures, but how much are we getting of this from everybody? And if I were to ask you how much of your total brain power and experience and passion and so forth is being tapped into by your firm, you know, is it 90%, 50%, 40%? I can tell you right now, if I ask that, you can think about the answer. For most groups that I've worked with over the years, it's usually 40, 50, 60%. That's a pretty modest number, right? Um, that that's really what organizations get out of people. So with energy crisis, talent being underutilized, brain power kind of being wasted, why is that the case? Again, on average, there's always exceptions. So we kind of want to understand the exceptions. And all of this leads to this. That's not the stuff that great projects, great initiatives are made of. So we did a study, and the study and the research and all of our thinking led kind of to this. All right? And I'm going to show you briefly the kind of organizations that we looked at. So I just look up here on the, on the, there we go. So we studied this team. What team is that? Thomas Edison, late 1800s. He had a team he called the Muckers. There wasn't Edison alone in, a, in, in kind of a back, back corner. He brought a team of 40, 50 people from around the world. That's his invention factory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And that's relevant, as we'll see later. We'll discuss this a little bit later. But he brought these together, and he changed the world seven or eight or nine times in a period of about 12 years. The electric light, recorded sound, on and on and on. But he understood how to tap into brain power. So that's one team we studied, and we write about it in there. Okay? Here's another team we looked at. The team that created West Side Story in the 1950s. Right? Now, you might say, what is, what is, these are all knowledge professionals. And they created West Side Story, Jerome Robbins, Stephen Sondheim, and Leonard Bernstein. It wasn't just they wanted to do great art. They wanted a commercial success, just like you. Edison had one objective. It wasn't to change money. Just like your firm's, Edison's objective was to put money in his back pocket as fast as possible. So these were commercial endeavors. So this team got together, and they said they wanted to change Broadway. And they changed it, right? At the end of West Side Story, there's death on the stage, there's gang warfare, it's the slums of New York. That was not Broadway in the 1950s. So we studied how they did their work. We interviewed people that worked with them, we read all that was written, and we looked at how that team accomplished great things. We looked at this team. Miles Davis, he brought together many different artists several different times to change the world of jazz. Okay? And he accomplished great things. How many of you have heard of Sid Caesar's comedy team of writers, right? Some of us, right? Yeah. Woody Allen, Mel Brooks, Larry Gel Gelbart, Carl Reiner, and Neil Simon were on one team led by this guy, Sid Caesar, in the 50s, and he changed how we viewed comedy. And, and the saying says, it's the greatest team of writers ever assembled since Shakespeare wrote alone. Right? I mean, and, and yet, and they had a, every week they had to produce a show for TV that people consumed and loved, and they did it. But how do you put together great talent like that and get the most out of it week after week? I'll bet you, have you heard of this team? Where I worked at IMD, the president was Norwegian. He insisted every program have a Norwegian hero in it. We had to go back to 19, 1910 when Roald Amundsen discovered the South Pole. He was the first person to get to the South Pole. But seriously, this was a Norwegian explorer who beat the British, and it was the last place on Earth that was undiscovered. This was like going to the moon. And he did it with a team of experts, and he got there first, and, one of, and the British died, this guy, Robert Falcon Scott. But we looked at how this team achieved their objective. And then we looked at this team. Everyone know what that is? Yeah. As the Nazis were goose-stepping across Europe, right? the, 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 the allies the, in, in Western Europe and the U.S. said, look, we got to get the team to get the best physicists together. We're going to stick them in New Mexico at a place called Los Alamos, and we're going to invent the atom bomb. Because we got to do it first. I mean, that was the era. And so these are all the physicists, including Oppenheimer and others, and they had to work together as a team. Fair enough? 